We would like to present our next speaker, Dr. Richard Horowitz, who is a founding member of ILADS and board certified internist in private practice in Hyde Park, New York. He is medical director of the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center, an integrative medical center which combines both classical and complementary approaches in the treatment of Lyme disease and other tick-borne disorders. He has treated over 12,000 chronic Lyme disease patients in the last 28 years. He is one of the founding members and past president-elects of ILADS and his New York Times best-selling book, Why Can't I Get Better? Solving the Mystery of Lyme and Chronic Disease, and his latest publication, How Can I Get Better? An Action Plan for Treating Resistant Lyme and Chronic Disease, explains his full classical and integrative approach to helping those with tick-borne diseases and resistant chronic illness. Please give a very warm welcome for Dr. Richard Horowitz. Thank you so much for inviting me. Can I see a show of hands just so I understand who I'm speaking to? How many people in the audience here have Lyme disease? Okay. How many doctors in the audience here? Okay. Chiropractors? Acupuncturists? Naturopaths? Okay. So since the majority of you have Lyme disease, we'll, uh, with a few exceptions for the doctors that are here, and thank you for coming, um, let me give you an overview of some of the newer things today that should help many of you to get better. We are in the middle of an epidemic, as many of you know. Dr. Bach started talking about the numbers, but the truth is, is we don't really know the true numbers of people that have Lyme. The CDC in 2013 basically said that this epidemic has gone tenfold to close to 400,000 people. But they did say, in fact, just two years ago that there was a 320% increase in the number of counties affected. And the fact that there are 3.5% of people in the United States who are diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and 1.5% of the US population that has been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, is there a test for chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia? Yes or no? No, it's a clinical diagnosis. You're tired, you have aches and pains, you can't sleep, and your memory doesn't work. How many people in the audience here were diagnosed with chronic fatigue and fibro before you actually got diagnosed with Lyme? Okay, not that many. How many people here were diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder like rheumatoid arthritis or MS before? Okay. So Lyme is the great imitator. The reason we don't really know the true figures is that we really can't get a handle because there are so many species of Borrelia that are emerging, which I'll tell you about today. But the, what's kind of interesting about the figures, um, and I'm going to be writing a letter to Congress, just so you know, I've been elected to serve on the Congressional Lyme Committee um, in Congress, so I will be driving to Washington, D.C. Thank you. So I'll be driving to Washington, D.C. in the next 10 days, and driving 535 signed copies of my book with letters to every member of Congress of the House and the Senate. The biggest problem, by the way, they're gonna have is when I sit on this committee is I have a very little filter between my brain and my mouth. Um, that may be the largest problem we're gonna face when I sit on that committee. Um, so, 19, you may not know these figures, but 19% of Americans are disabled. This is according to the National Census Bureau. Almost one out of five Americans is disabled. 50 million people have been diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder in the United States. 5% have chronic fatigue and fibro. The autism rates, as Ken was telling you, went from about one in 150 in 2000 to one in 68 in 2012. And we have an Alzheimer's epidemic where every 67 seconds, someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in this country. So we have a chronic disease epidemic. Our Congress has been trying to figure out how do we lower healthcare costs and how do we improve care? What you'll see in the letter that eventually goes to them is that 86% of our healthcare costs are due to chronic disease, 86%. 70% of the deaths in the United States are due to chronic disease. And the key to all chronic disease, and Dr. Bach was telling you about it, is inflammation. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today to kind of sum this up for you is to carry on with what he initially talked about, is to show you how the 16-point MSITS model that is in both of my books 
how you can take a look at it from an inflammatory standpoint and see who actually has Lyme disease, number one, but how do you get rid of the symptoms? Because it turns out, for those of you who still complain of chronic fatigue and migratory arthralgias that come and go with good and bad days where it migrates around your body, and migratory pain, by the way, is the hallmark of Lyme. We'll talk about this in a second. But for those of you who still have the cognitive difficulties, the brain fog, you can't fall asleep, you keep waking up, you have mood disorders, it's due to inflammation. There are inflammatory molecules, TNF-alpha, intraleukin-1, IL-6, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, all these inflammatory molecules get produced. The key to getting better is you don't just hit the infections, and we'll talk about the co-infections and the rest, but you've got to get to all the underlying causes of where the inflammation is coming from. The problem in the United States right now is this one. So the bad news is you have Lyme disease, the good news is I don't believe in the disease. And this is unfortunately still this debate that goes on politically in the United States. So it's the number one spreading epidemic. And what's interesting about it, it's not just Lyme, it's the tick-borne infections, and I'll show you the figures in just a minute. But it's not just Borrelia burgdorferi Lyme disease. It's Borrelia miyamotoi, relapsing fever rates that are going up. It's Babesia, it's Anaplasma, it's Powassan virus. So we have to be very careful because there are many tick-borne diseases that are rising. Some of these diseases can be transmitted in the blood. Um, four out of 1,000 blood transfusions now in the United States contain babesiosis. So if you go to a hospital and you don't get Red Cross green blood, and you happen to be very young or very elderly, you could die from babesia. Anaplasma is in the blood supply. Bartonella is in the blood supply. Relapsing fever can be transmitted. Okay, in the blood supply. We have to be very, very careful. And there is maternal fetal transmission. And unfortunately, a lot of the OBGYNs are not paying attention to the fact when the women come in for checkups, they don't give them the MSITS questionnaire, which we'll show you in just a second, to see who should be screened, actually, to see if they have a tick-borne disorder. We'll also talk a little bit about the possibility of sexual transmission. The problem earlier, and Ken was talking about this, we don't like to talk about chronic Lyme disease. What I call it is Lyme MSIDS. And the reason I named it Lyme MSIDS, or Multiple Systemic Infectious Disease Syndrome, is that I've discovered there are up to 16 reasons why people stay ill with this disease. And it's literally like going into a doctor's office with 16 nails in your foot and telling the doctor you have foot pain. If you don't pull out all the nails, you're just not going to get better. Right? So the real key is you've got to find what is causing the inflammatory response. In some people, it's Babesia. In some people, it's Lyme and Bartonella. In some people, it's low adrenal function. In some, it's getting them to sleep. You have to go through the 16-point model piece by piece to figure out why you still may be ill. We're going to talk a little bit about the diagnostic testing. I think most of you know that it's pretty much a coin flip. Right? It's about a 50% chance. But I'm going to talk to you today about some of the newer tests that are coming out and a very logical approach using these newer tests to figure out who has Lyme, although still the baseline is it is a clinical diagnosis. It is not a diagnosis you make based on the blood test alone. As far as treating Lyme disease, we'll talk a little bit about chronic infection, and yes, these do persist. And the new term we're now using, which I'll talk to you about today, is persisters. So it's interesting that in 30 years of doing this with over 12,000 people, there's not a doubt in my mind I knew that Lyme persisted. But what I never realized is it was a persister. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you go into the medical literature and you look at certain diseases like tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, or leprosy, or chronic Q fever, these are persisters, meaning they go dormant in the body for periods of time. And some of these may be found under biofilms. So we're going to talk about the new biofilm research, how these bugs are in dormant phases in these biofilms. When you go deep in the biofilms, it's anaerobic. There's no oxygen getting in there. So it's very difficult sometimes to get your drugs and herbs all the way down. And we're going to talk a little bit about why these biofilms are so important and why persisters are so important. But the hallmark for today's talk also regarding persisters is Lyme is not the only persister. Bartonella is a persister. I have clear evidence after years of treating people that a Bartonella fish test from Igenix, the fish stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization, it's an RNA test, we'll get back positives after years of treating. The key that I'll be discussing with you today is you need three to four intracellular drugs 
for some of these persisters that do not get better in the worst patients, right? Not all of you will need this treatment. I'm talking about the very severely ill. So Bartonella is a persister bacteria, as is Lyme. So are mycoplasma species. Mycoplasma are intracellular, like Bart, like Lyme, causing inflammation. Tularemia, brucella, persisters. And Babesia is a persister parasite. So just know that when you're treating these organisms, you have to be treating them for long enough periods of time, rotating through protocols to be able to get people better. So Lyme clearly is the great imitator. The way you know that it's not chronic fatigue and fibro is the following. Someone just asked me this question while I was signing one of the books. If you have, and this is the hallmark of Lyme, good and bad days where the symptoms come and go, and the joint pain, the muscle pain, and the nerve pain, the tingling, numbness, burning, stabbing feelings, if it comes and goes and moves around your body, migratory joint pain, nerve pain, and muscle pain is the hallmark of Lyme disease. We have a paper, I believe it might have just gotten into the medical literature. We submitted it yesterday to a journal. I'll show you the paper. We validated the questionnaire in my book in 1,600 people through the State University of New Paltz. And we found that when we looked at the healthy population or the people who had Lyme, 90% of those people who had Lyme disease had migratory pain. One, two, or three. The healthy population, it was a coin flip. It was highly statistically significant. Good and bad days, coming and going, migratory, if you're a woman, you'll notice around the menstrual cycle, when your estradiol goes down, that's when all your Lyme symptoms come out. And if you happen to take an antibiotic for an unrelated infection, a urinary tract infection, an upper respiratory infection, your symptoms get better from knocking down the load of the bacteria, or it gets worse, which is a Herxheimer reaction, right? Which are, the, by the way, the same inflammatory molecules we're gonna be discussing um, here this afternoon. So those are pretty much the hallmark keys, plus of course having the problems with memory concentration where your doctor has ruled out underlying causes. So the majority of the patients who come to see me have MSIDs. They have autoimmune reactions. They have Babesia. They have Bartonella. They can't fall asleep. They have multiple food allergies. They have leaky gut. They have immune dysfunction. They have multiple overlapping factors and I have to figure out what are those factors, right, or the patients will not get completely better. So we know that the early cases of Lyme, when they were investigated initially in 1975, and we were now, you know, 40 plus years later, and we're still debating, right? What is chronic Lyme disease? Does it really persist in the body? Are the blood tests reliable? So it's a big, big problem. But again, from my perspective, it's really the co-infections, and we'll see, we'll talk about this as the talk goes on, that are really the biggest factors keeping many of these people sick, because no one comes in and sees me at this point, we're just Lyme alone. In fact, just to make it simple, even though there were many co-infections, the majority of the sickest patients who see me have Babesia and have Bartonella, okay? Just to make it simple, and when I show you the treatment protocols, whether you had mycoplasma or chlamydia pneumonia or tularemia or brucellosis um, or Q fever, Coxiella burnetti, any of these other infections that are intracellular, the antibiotic regimens I'm gonna tell you about will hit them all at the same point in time. So that's the beauty is even if you can't pick them all up on your blood tests, we'll show you treatment protocols that will cover, cover the majority of them. It's very important to have preventative measures. So when you go outside, permethrin treated clothes, permethrin will kill the ticks, right? You can either buy them in the stores or use permethrin, spray it on your clothes outside, not on you. It will kill the ticks. We use things like picaridin and IR3535, which Avon Skin So Soft makes. There were studies in Europe in pregnant women. They've used this for over 30 years and it was shown to be safe. So IR3535 and picaridin can be put on the skin. It repels the ticks, but it doesn't kill them. So you still have to be careful because with a tick bite, although most people think that it takes 24 to 36 hours to get Lyme, there are studies in the medical literature that go around six hours. Some of my patients have told me it has been within hours. And Powassan virus gets into the body within 15 minutes of a tick bite. Rickettsial infections like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever gets in within 10 minutes of a tick bite. And Borrelia hermsi relapsing fever, that's the winner, five minutes of a tick bite. And that is why you must do tick prevention. So you have to be very, very careful. You can bring your clothes inside, put them in the dryer, right? High heat for around 15 minutes will kill the ticks. Be very, very careful with it. The National Science Foundation has basically said that this is a pandemic 
with the World Health Organization, they have now labeled Lyme disease, right, as a pandemic, and we're looking at Ebola viruses in West Nile and dengue fever um, and the Chikungunya virus. There are many viruses, but Lyme has now been labeled as a pandemic. And just so you understand from the CDC's perspective, the way you identify an emerging epidemic is if 5% of the animals in a state have been diagnosed with a disease like Lyme disease, it is considered an emerging epidemic. When I testified before Congress in Vermont several years ago, the Vermont Department of Health reported that 16% of the dogs in Vermont had Lyme disease. So I told the Vermont Congress that if 16% of Vermonters had Lyme, 675,000 Vermonters, $5 billion healthcare budget, that would cost $1 billion in their healthcare budget just for treating Lyme disease in Vermont. Okay? We're talking about an epidemic and a pandemic worldwide. When the Chinese government invited me years ago as a consultant and flew me over to Beijing, they privately told me that 6% of the Chinese population had been diagnosed with Lyme disease. That was years ago. That's the other side of the world. And that's not even including all the Borrelia species that are out there. So the WHO is seeing with climate change, and there's no doubt about it, that the ticks are changing. They're coming out three weeks earlier. Rick Gosfeld from the Institute of Ecosystem Studies showed that ticks are now coming out in April because of climate change three weeks earlier. So even though May is Lyme Awareness Month, they are coming out earlier. We're seeing all these different infections in the ticks, but you can also get fleas with Bartonella species. You can get black flies, which contain Bartonella, um, infected snails, mosquitoes. The problem right now is, is that many of these insect-borne diseases, many of us are getting overlaps at the same point in time. So co-infections are the rule. This was just published last year in France. They found 36 different pathogens in ticks in France. So when you look at it and you see that there's seven Lyme spirochetes and one relapsing fever, um, Candidatus neocrylicia micarensis, we don't have here. If you think Lyme is the great imitator, this one in Europe imitates non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and lupus. So people in Europe, they discovered this in Switzerland years ago. We don't have this bug yet in the United States. They, they found one Bartonella species, but 10 species of Babesia. So how do you think, how easy do you think it's going to be for them to find Babesiosis in patients in France when there's 10 different species? They're not looking for all the different species. Here we're mainly looking at Babesia microti and Babesia wall-1-dumcani. They've got Babesia divergens in Europe, but they also have Babesia EU1 and other species, but the docs are not looking for it. So how do you know if you have Babesiosis? Day sweats, night sweats can be drenching, chills, flushing, air hunger, I can't catch my breath, Ken talked about this, a cough you can't explain. In internal medicine, there are three main causes of coughs. Allergic rhinitis with a post-nasal drip, asthma, and GERD reflux. That's 99% of most coughs, assuming you don't have COPD um, or other causes. But you'll find with the people who go to the pulmonologist, they say, my pulmonary functions are normal, I keep coughing, I'm short of breath. Once you treat the Babesia, it gets better. So any of you in the audience who have day sweats, night sweats, chills, flushing, air hunger, cough, please raise your hand. Okay, so probably at least a third of the people who raised their hands earlier that said they had Lyme, you most likely have babesiosis. Now, you have to do a differential diagnosis. You have to make sure you don't have other causes, obviously, of sweats. Early menopause, malaria, hyperthyroidism, tuberculosis, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. There's a section in my book, for those of you who did not go to medical school and did not learn how to do a differential, there's probably 15 pages, and I updated it in the new book, How Can I Get Better?, where you look at sweats and you work with your doctor and you go down the list piece by piece to find out why you're having these unexplained sweats. So it is co-infections are the rule. The Poisson virus in our area went from one to 2% to five to 6%. The equine encephalitis rates in Vermont up to 10% in ticks. Anaplasma rates doubled. And Borrelia miyamotoi, this relapsing fever Borrelia, the reason this is so tricky is because in our area in Dutchess County, where we live, about 10 to 20% of the ticks are containing it. If you went to the other part of the United States in San Francisco in the Bay Area, and you take ticks, half of them contain Borrelia burgdorferi, the other half of Borrelia miyamotoi. So here's the tricky part with this relapsing fever. Relapsing fever Borrelia, like Borrelia miyamotoi, can give you an EM rash, it can give you Bell's palsy, it can give you a meningitis, 
It can give you joint aches. But if you do the standard testing for Lyme with an ELISA and a Western blot, it will be negative. So you have a Lyme-like illness with other Borrelia species. The other reason this is difficult is because under the biofilms, Borrelia are having sex. They exchange their DNA. So when you have multiple species of Borrelia under the biofilms, those bugs are constantly changing in your body. So this is problematic. We already know that with relapsing fever, they're challenging their outer surface proteins, which Lyme also does. That's why the Lyme vaccine wasn't working in part, apart from the autoimmune phenomenon. They had an OSPE vaccine. And once the bug starts going into your body, some people, the OSPE goes down and the OSPC comes up and upregulates. So we have to find ways to be able to hit not just one species, but many of these species. But it's tricky because they are changing all the time and they're exchanging genetic information. The other thing about Miyamotoi is it's transmitted from the mother ticks directly into the eggs. It's called transovarial transmission, where the ticks don't have to feed off of a mouse or a deer or a raccoon or a fox. The mother, might, mother actually just passes it right on into the eggs in 6 to 73% of the time. So as bad as the Lyme disease epidemic is, you're probably going to see an epidemic of Borrelia miyamotoi and these type of species probably overtake it, I would suspect, in the next 10 to 15 years. So all of these other species of Borrelia, you have to be on the look for. And just know that the standard testing for Lyme is not going to pick it up. I was the first doctor to diagnose Babesia in the Hudson Valley. It's about 17 years ago. Jill Auerbach, who's in the audience, invited Rick Osfeld and I over. We had a discussion on Babesia. We sent the ticks to Igenix in California. A few percentage of the ticks had Babesia. The reason I knew Babesia was there, because my first test case, this woman was in her 30s, was paralyzed from the waist down, could not walk, being treated by an excellent Lyme literate physician. She had drenching night sweats in her 30s. I said it sounds like Babesia, but it was not supposed to be in Dutchess County. We treated her with Mepron and Zithromax, the classic regimen used to treat Babesia. Ten days later, she walked out of the wheelchair for the first time in five years. So one nail in the foot, Babesia, that was the thing that made her better. Now when we check the ticks, 40% of the ticks in Dutchess County now have Babesia. From 2 to 3% to over 40%. What about other parasitic infections like filariasis? So here's the problem. If you take an anti-parasitic protocol and you feel better, and I don't just mean Mepron and Zithromax, I mean Ivermectin, Alinea, Albendazole, Biltricide, anti-parasitic drugs, and you say, Doc, it's the first thing that made me better. I'll give you an example. I have a kid from Pennsylvania. He's in a wheelchair for two and a half years with Parkinson's disease in his 30s. He went to eight neurologists, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. He's drooling, he's got Parkinsonian symptoms, he can't walk. We tested him, he had Lyme, he had Babesia with drenching sweats, he had West Nile virus, he had mold toxins, he had pesticide levels that were extremely high with Parkinson's, right? I rotated him through all the drug regimens, but nothing got him up and walking until I gave him an anti-parasitic drug called Daraprim. And within one month of taking Daraprim, this kid walked out of the wheelchair for the first time. Now, Daraprim is not used for Lyme disease. <laughs> Daraprim is not normally used for Babesia, but I've used antiparasitic drugs with great effectiveness. So hallmark of these diseases, there may be other parasites that have gotten into your body. So Eva Shapi and other researchers have found filarial organisms, but we don't know at this point if many of you here who respond to anti-parasitic drugs may actually have this or not. The testing, again, is not so easy. But just know that if you're a resistant Lyme patient, and you've come here today to listen to my talk, and you're trying to figure out how can I get better, write on your piece of paper, test me for every parasite known to mankind, intestinal parasites, check for fluoriasis, and consider a trial of anti-parasitics. Because there are people with Morgellons disease, with resistant illness, that will tell you they feel much better with these type of protocols. So the incidence is going up, but again, we really don't know. The CDC basically said that it was 0.3% of the US population several years ago. I put forth to you that with 50 million Americans having autoimmune diseases and 5% of the American population having chronic fatigue and fibro, okay, and early dementia, where Lyme can cause dementia. We're going to talk about what's being found in Alzheimer's research. I suspect at this point it's at least one to two million cases per year. 
And if you just look at chronic fatigue fibro, I would not at all be surprised that probably about 10% of the American population has probably been infected at this point in time. This is what I was referring to with the new Borrelia species. There's 15 new Borrelia species in the last 20 years. That means that it's about one Borrelia species per year that we've been discovering, okay? One of the last ones that you're seeing in here, Borrelia bassetti, was implicated as a, a Borrelia that can cause illness in California. And you'll see other ones like in the southern US where supposedly Lyme disease did not exist. Kerry Clark from the University of Florida basically found that a lot of these people with chronic fatiguing musculoskeletal illnesses in the south didn't necessarily have Borrelia burgdorferi, but they had other Borrelia species like Americanum or Carolensis. So again, the key is you won't test necessarily positive on the testing if you have other species. I'll give you a great example. I have a Hollywood VIP on the other side of the US who has an MS diagnosis. This particular person did not test positive on a standard Western blot for Lyme, but when I went to Hygenics and I said, could you please test her for Borrelia californtris? In other words, the California strain of Borrelia, the Western blot lit up. That's not a Western blot you're normally gonna get. So what we may need to be doing, Igenix at this point is the main lab I use because they use the two strains, the 297 and the B31. We may need to start expanding out depending on country specific Western blots like in Europe, even state specific depending on what kind of species of Borrelia that you have. So the blood transmission is there. We don't really know exactly the true number of cases, but as I said to you earlier, you have to be very careful asking the hospitals for Red Cross screen blood um, if you do require a blood transfusion. And again, these co-infections are gonna increase underlying symptoms. So the key with it is, is that Babesia makes your Lyme symptoms three times worse. When Peter Krause published that article in JAMA 20 years ago on Lyme and Babesia, what he found is we could discover the DNA of Borrelia burgdorferi in the blood three times more frequently when you had Babesia. Babesia suppresses your immune system. Lyme suppresses your immune system. When Ken was talking about the autistic population with pans pandas, where some of these kids need IVIG, IV immunoglobulins, we find the same thing in Lyme. Lyme causes chronic variable immune deficiency, CVID. For those of you who are sick and have not had your immunoglobulin levels checked, both IgA, IgM, and IgG, and subclasses we find this in a fairly large number of patients who are not getting better. If your immune system is suppressed from Lyme, if Babesia is suppressing your ability to get rid of other parasites, including intestinal parasites, Bartonella suppresses your immunity. Mercury and some of these environmental toxins lead to autoimmune illness and also cause problems with immunity. We're just basically, it's a, it's a perfect storm of why your immune system is having a tough time fighting the bugs. So we have to be careful, especially because, as Ken was talking about with Bartonella rage, Bartonella, mycoplasma, uh, Babesia, all of these species are found in people that are chronically ill. So maternal transmission, the first time I learned about this, I called her Mary in my book. This woman was treated for two years with Lyme antibiotics, came in and said, Doc, I feel perfect. I want to get pregnant. I said, absolutely no symptoms. She said, I had like a migratory twinge three weeks ago, literally a twinge. I said, that's it? She said, I'm great. I said, fine, go get pregnant. 12 weeks later, she comes in, she's had a miscarriage. She got pregnant. We did a DNA analysis on the fetus and it turned out that the baby was positive for Lyme disease after two years of continuous treatment. She said, I'm gonna try again. She got pregnant again. The same thing happened at 12 weeks. So we basically checked the placenta and the baby PCR positive. I had to put her on IV rocephin during the first trimester of pregnancy, and she finally had a healthy child. So for those of you who've seen Under Our Skin, the documentary, some of you have seen it. You remember Jared who's running around in the movie? That was the baby. That was, that was a little boy that basically needed IV rocephin to, baby, to basically be healthy. The OBGYNs are not paying attention to this. Lyme is transmitted to the fetus. Borrelia miyamotoi and Borrelia relapsing fever can cause hemorrhages in the mother, can cause strokes in a mother, can cause disseminated intravascular coagulation where mothers bleed out during pregnancy with these relapsing fever Borrelia. This is a nightmare for future generations of this country. Bartonella is transmitted, Lyme is transmitted. We have to be really careful. 
The MSITS questionnaire that I'm about to show you, now that we validated it and should be in the medical literature published in the next few months, that is a screening tool that every OBGYN or psychiatrist, when people are sitting in the office going, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm hallucinating, I have OCD, I have obsessive compulsive disorder, because Lyme causes every psychiatric manifestation, the psychiatrists, it's known 20% of the time, don't find out if the people have physical symptoms. So you have to be very careful. This is the great imitator. The questionnaire has now been validated. Over 63 on the questionnaire is highly significant, two standard deviations above the mean. Sexual transmission, we're not sure. The reason I don't think it's likely, I'm not saying never, is because when you look at the epidemiology of Lyme disease in the United States, it spikes in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall. And as far as I know, people are still having relations in the wintertime. Is that generally true? Yes. The other thing is about sexually transmitted diseases, or even anyone, you don't transmit strep throat for one or two strep on your tonsils. You have to have huge amounts of bacteria. With Lyme disease, which is different than syphilis, if you actually look carefully at the slide that Ken showed you, syphilis has thousands and thousands of these bacteria. There's not that many bacteria in the body with Lyme. But they're hiding in places, causing autoimmunity and causing an overstimulated immune system. So the difference is there's very few they found in the sperm and vaginal secretions, just one or two. We need animal studies. It's not that it's impossible. I'm sure there probably are some cases where it happens. But we definitely need much better studies at this point in time. So regarding Lyme and co-infections, what you need to know about acute Lyme, especially at this time of the year, Ken showed you pictures of bullseye rashes. So if at this time of the year, someone, let's say you were a physician and you went into the doctor's office with a flu-like symptom, there was a young man in our area, Joseph Aloni, he was a 17-year-old black male about to go to college. He was in Rhode Island. He came back to Poughkeepsie, New York, and he was complaining of a sore throat and nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. And the doctor said, you have a virus. He comes back several days later. They said, okay, you're in Rhode Island. Let's check you for Lyme. Let's do an ELISA. The ELISA was negative. He died three weeks later. He had Lyme carditis. The Lyme had spread throughout his body. The ELISA is not a very good test. So if you have flu-like symptoms, but especially photophobia, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, a stiff neck, a headache, if you get a bullseye rash, and you've got a stiff neck headache, light sound sensitivity, memory problems, dizziness, that means the Lyme's gotten up into your central nervous system and 30 days is not gonna cure you for your EM rash. If you have peripheral nervous system symptoms, tingling, numbness, burning, stabbing feelings of your extremities with a bullseye rash, the Lyme has gotten into your peripheral nervous system. 30 days of antibiotics is not gonna cure it. If you look at the old Gary Wormser articles that were published over 20 years ago, and antimicrobial agents and chemotherapy, those were the patients that failed the classic therapies. They had central nervous system or peripheral nervous system Lyme. Most people would understand this is a bullseye rash, right? And, but the tricky part is when it's a solid spread redding rash. Those are the ones that often people come in and say, my doctor said I had a cellulitis. Yes. I had a bacterial infection in my skin, or I was bitten by a spider, right? Those are the ones you hear most often. But actually, from the smith klein Beecham study, less than 50% had rashes, less than 25% of them had even bullseye rashes in this country. In Europe, they report a lot more. But we don't get that many. You have to watch out for the spreading red rash. So disseminated Lyme, again, an EM rash with sound sensitivity, light, neck stiffness, tingling, numbness, burning. Be careful, those are not ones you're just gonna treat with 30 days. And in my new book, again, I have all of the protocols. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. But what we generally do is we try and hit all of the different forms of Lyme. The cell wall forms, the cystic forms, the intracellular forms, the biofilm, the dormant forms, the persisters. You have to start looking at this when you're gonna treat it because you've got a possibility of a cure. All of the scientific literature has basically said that the testing is unreliable, okay? I have over 850 scientific references in the back of my book about all of the things I'll be talking to you about today. So I don't need to belabor it, except that John Hopkins showed years ago that it would miss 55% of Lyme cases early on. Now this just got published just a couple of weeks ago. What's interesting about Dr. Puri's study, and I know uh, Bassan Puri from the UK because he and I have shared patients over time, is that when he looked at the probability of the false negative test for Lyme for early stage, it was 66%, almost 75% for the two-tiered testing. 
60 times as many false negative results versus HIV. And for late stage Lyme, almost 17% false negative, um, 170 fold difference versus HIV. So the two tier test generated 500 times more false negative results than HIV testing. So this is, these are basically not reliable. And again, going back to all these Borrelia species, Borrelia miyamotoi, Hermsi, relapsing fever, just know you're not going to pick them all up. The key is you want to look for the Borrelia specific bands on the Western blot. So we know that Lyme is the great imitator, chronic fatigue, fibro, all these different autoimmune diseases. And the problem with the autoimmunity is Lyme causes anti-nuclear antibodies to form. So you might go to a rheumatologist who tells you you have lupus, except when you treat the Lyme, the ANAs go down, okay? The specific marker for lupus is called the double-stranded DNA. It is 95% sensitive and specific for lupus. For rheumatoid arthritis, you can get rheumatoid factors produced with Lyme. But CCP, cyclic citrullated peptide, that again is very specific for rheumatoid arthritis. But here's the problem. This is an easy one, but you'll be surprised how many doctors miss this. Is it possible to have rheumatoid arthritis and get bitten by a tick? Everyone who says yes, please raise your hand. Excellent. So Brad, I'll tell you the story. Brad had Lyme disease, he had Babesia, and he had Bagel's disease, okay? What is Bagel's disease? So Brad comes in to see me, he has true rheumatoid arthritis, okay? He's CCP positive. Several rheumatologists, every drug, prednisone, methotrexate, Arava, Enbrel, nothing works, okay? He's in his late 30s. I say to him with the pain, does it migrate around your body? What is migratory pain? Lyme disease. He's in his 30s and he has drenching sweats. Does he have menopause? <laughs> no. What does he have? Babesia. Excellent. And then, so I treat his Lyme and Babesia. I'm giving him bicillin shots and treating him with Mepron and Zithromax. And his knee swelling goes down. The synovitis is getting better. But every Sunday, when he eats bagels, lox, and cream cheese, his knee swells up to three times the size. Okay. <laughs> He was gluten sensitive, and every time he would eat gluten, his joints would swell up. So he had Lyme disease, Babesia, and Bagel's disease. <laughs> By the way, in medicine, if you never know what's wrong with someone, just name it after anything that happens to them that way. So it's the great imitator. It's associated with inflammation in the CNS, and again, co-infections are playing a role. So what's interesting about the inflammation I'm going to go into this in a, in a second, and it follows up on what Ken was talking about, is if you have people that come in with certain resistant diseases, okay, like pain disorders, almost every pain disorder I have seen in my practice, unresolving chest pain, which is costochondritis, inflammation in the chest wall, okay, or neuropathy, doc, I'm taking Lyrica, I'm taking Neurontin, I'm taking Elevil, I'm on narcotics, I can't get my pain or my nerve pain to get better. Most of those patients who do get better in my practice, they have Lyme and Bartonella. So be careful, it's not just Lyme. Most of these chronic pain syndromes, interstitial cystitis for the women who keep going from urologist to urologist, oftentimes Lyme and Bartonella. We find that the co-infections are often associated with many of these type of difficult to treat pain syndromes. Um, the men will come in with andropause. They'll come in in their 20s with no testosterone because the inflammatory response in the body shuts off your pituitary gland, which is the master hormone regulator in your body. So men come in with low testosterone, women come in with early menopause, 40% of the people have no adrenal function, and they don't get better. So you have to be very careful because the inflammatory response, if you have an unresolving pain syndrome of any type, and they can't figure it out, look for Lyme, look for co-infections like BART, and also look for environmental toxins. We'll talk about that in a second because they can drive an autoimmune process and keep the pain cycle going. So again, it's important for you to understand the key points because if you're diagnosed with chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia, an autoimmune disease or early dementia, the hallmark of Lyme is good and bad days and the symptoms come and go and it migrates and the hormonal cycles in women make you worse and you're better or worse with antibiotics, right? And then you start looking, for example, at all the multisystemic signs. So this is the questionnaire, which I initially adapted from Dr. Borscano years ago, and what I did with it is I basically used frequency and severity, and I scored it. 
And this is the paper that we just, I'm not sure if Mariella Cetera put this into the literature yesterday, but we've been working on the study now for three years. We got an IRB, an institutional review board from State University of New Paltz, and we did an online questionnaire and we looked at three practices in the Northeast that treat Lyme disease, 1,600 people. We collected data on healthy patients, on people with Lyme disease, and basically what we found is that the questionnaire had convergent, divergent, construct validity, and predictive validity. What that means from a statistical standpoint is, is it works. <laughs> but I changed the scoring from my first book. So the new scoring is in the second book, How Can I Get Better? And it's 63 or higher is a high probability, and in the 40s, 50s, and low 60s is moderate probability. But when the, the paper should be out in a couple of months, but this will be very useful for chiropractors, naturopaths, physicians, OBGYN, psychiatrists, this costs nothing. All you have to do is give it out to people in the waiting room, see if they have a multi-systemic disorder, get a score, and then we're gonna talk about how to do a Lyme panel of testing. So the way that we make the diagnosis is it's a clinical diagnosis, right? But you always have to do a differential. Now, I don't use an ELISA test anymore. The first test I go for at this point is a C6 ELISA with an IgM, IgG Western blot from IgenX. And the reason we use IgenX is because it uses two strains. You might think that that second strain doesn't make a difference, but I can tell you from having done this for three decades, it's huge in looking at Borrelia-specific bands. So we play a game with the patients called Lyme Bingo, right? If you have any one of the following numbers, bingo, you've been exposed to a Borrelia species, right? So it's on the IgenX blot, but it's the 23, the outer surface protein C, the 31, the outer surface protein A. The only time you would get a false positive outer surface protein A is if you had the Lyme vaccine years ago, and your immunity would have worn off by now, or certain viruses like Epstein-Barr and autoimmune can sometimes give you a false positive 31. There is a test from Igenix called the 31 epitope test. You can run that to see if it's due to Lyme. The 34 is the outer surface protein B, 39, very highly specific for Lyme, and finally the 8393. So even if you have a bullseye rash in the Midwest, like star eye, southern tick-associated rash-like illness, or master's disease, as it was called years ago, if you look for patients who had those Borrelia bands, and I looked through all of Ed's studies years ago, four out of five of those bands were positive on the Western blots for people with star eye in the Midwest, even though they said it's a benign type of rash, doesn't cause a problem. The reason Ed Masters, by the way, would not sign on to the paper with the CDC is some people had Lyme carditis in the Midwest like Joseph Alone, and they were leaving them out of the papers when they were looking at it. It was in 2013 the CDC started coming out and actually finding more cases of Lyme carditis in the United States. So we have to be careful again looking at these different strains, but a C6 followed by that and looking at these Borrelia-specific bands, very helpful. Now, let's say you don't get a C6 positive. Can you do an ELISA? Yes. I've had patients that are C6 ELISA negative, regular ELISA positive, or ELISA negative C6 positive. I've had most of my chronic Lyme patients are IgM Western blot positive. Is IgM Western blots just positive in early Lyme or also in late Lyme? That's correct, it's both. The reason is, and this was shown years ago from the University of California, from Nicole Baumgart's lab, is that when Borrelia invades the lymph nodes, in your body, it destroys the part of the lymph nodes that makes IgG antibodies. And that's why you get many more IgM antibodies in people with Lyme. And you're not gonna see as many. When Brian Fallon did the NIH double-blind study, published in 2008 in neurology, he had to screen roughly 3,600 people with known Lyme to get 36 positive IgG Western blots. One out of 100 were CDC positive for IgG Western blots. Okay, so we do panels at this point. We might look at PCRs, but it's very difficult to get a PCR in the blood because Borrelia does not hang out in your bloodstream. It likes collagen tissues. It likes going deep into the body. You can do a lymphocyte transformation test like the Ellie spot. Okay, sensitivity specificity is not bad. Okay, you can do advanced lab cultures. The CDC, however, has challenged the validity of that test. So if you look at the indirect tests, you can do a panel approach, and this is what I recommend if people are really questioning whether you have it. If the C6 and the Western blot is negative, you can do an immunofluorescent assay, an IFA, OK? 
okay? Or you can do an LTT or a Spira test. Now the Spira test, Joseph Filoni would not have died if that test was available. This is a test that was developed through John Hopkins University where they're finding other inflammatory mediators which are released early on in the course of the disease. So not the same inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-1, IL-6, but they're called inflammatory chemokines. They pull your white cells and your lymphocytes to the site of infection. They're called CXCL9, CXCL10, and CCL19. John Alcott from John Hopkins has now seen that CCL19 is being found in people with chronic Lyme disease. This may be one of the markers as a marker of persistent Lyme, and that still needs to be determined in the future. Let's say your indirect tests are negative. You may be able to get a direct test by PCR. The nanotrap test we can't get in New York. Um, it measures the OSP-A, the 31, in the urine, and they've actually gotten reasonably good sensitivity specificity, or the Lyme.blot that you can also get um, from Igenix, which can be done on urine, it can be done on cerebral spinal fluid. And, and Ken was saying earlier, the CSF, the spinal, spinal fluid, the reason it's negative in a lot of these people is there's immune complexes where the antibodies and the antigens of the bacteria are bound together, that's why you're not getting positive testing. There was one point years ago that Stony Brook was doing a dissociation test of the antigen antibodies, and Ken, Ken Liebner, who works about an hour from me in New York, found that about 25% of his patients that he suspected neurological Lyme were positive on that Stony Brook test. Unfortunately, they're not doing the test at this point. So this was the initial study done from John Hopkins University, um, looking at some of these inflammatory mediators, and again, hopefully the Spira test will be validated and we'll have it in the next couple of years. Again, the problem we talked about this is all these different species like Borrelia miyamotoi, not going to test positive. Same problem with Babesia. If you only check for Babesia microti, but you have Wa1 duncani, the titer is going to be negative. So what do I do for Babesia? A panel approach. I do a Babesia fish test, fluorescent in C2 hybridization. We find that sometimes using the RNA technology, not DNA, but RNA, we can pick up these bugs better. And TGen, which is out in Arizona, they're developing a whole panel of testing using RNA technology because there's much more RNA in the ribosomes of the cell than there is DNA. So we should have those panels. When I spoke to Paul Keim, who's the head of the lab, I said, Paul, I need every species of Borrelia, every species of Babesia, every 17 pathogenic strains of Bartonella, all the mycoplasma strains, right? And he's doing this in his lab. So what I suspect, I'm gonna make you a prediction, that about five or 10 years from now, when they start screening all these people with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and autoimmune diseases, right, um, and early dementia, you're gonna find that the majority of these people had environmental toxins combined with multiple infections. Because Bartonella will cause, by the way, the same type of inflammatory symptoms you see with Lyme. So if you haven't gotten better from Lyme, it could be Bartonella as an intracellular pathogen, and that's why at the end of this talk, I'll tell you about the new protocols we're using to get people better. So we expand the testing for Babesia. We always check for things like Q fever, uh, Ehrlichia anaplasma, uh, Bartonella. One of the tests for Bartonella, the VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, um, this is an associate test that you can do through LabCorp Quest Bioreference. Um, we do like bioreference laboratories, by the way, because they send it out to a different reference lab for BART. We get a lot of positive Bartonella Henselae through bioreference when LabCorp Quest is negative. So if you have bioreference in this area, you might want to consider using that for some of your tick-borne testing. But uh, ultimately, for me, we have to screen for all the points on the MSITS map. And, and again, the reason you've gone from doctor to doctor for all of these problems is the two standards of care, IDSA, infectious disease, versus ILADS, are completely different, right? IDSA is it's easy to diagnose and easy to treat, and ILADS, it's definitely not easy to diagnose. It's a clinical diagnosis, and there's persistence of not just Lyme, but many of these other co-infections. So the treatment failure without spending a lot of time, the medical literature definitely shows it. What's interesting about the first study by Klempner is I participated in the first double-blind NIH study. I picked Dr. Klempner up from Newburgh Airport, drove him to my office, showed him studies where we had, at that point, we were taking Polaroid pictures of EM rashes, um, and we did sign up some of our patients. And he said, gee, doxy and rocephin doesn't work for Lyme disease. But he's also the same author around the same time that said, if you take 
fibroblasts in the skin, which are certain cells in your skin, and they're containing Lyme disease, and you put it in a vat of rocephin for days, and then you take it out, the Lyme spirochete's still alive. So he's saying it persists in the fibroblasts, but the antibiotics don't work, but they never said in the double-blind study that one of the reasons it may not have worked is that it's hiding in protective niches in the body where the antibiotics can't get out of it. But you can see that there's studies for eyes, ligaments, joints, Endothelial cells and macrophages, this is where I think actually most of the inflammation is coming from. Most of our patients that have the worst symptoms, the drugs that have the greatest effect are probably the intracellular drugs. Not rocephin, not bicillin, not amoxicillin, but intracellular. Now that's not across the board, but certainly some of my sickest patients. The treatment failures, we didn't know this years ago, in part were due to biofilms. Dr. Shapi and McDonald's have shown this. Um, and again, we see these treatment failures with persisters of the other bugs. The NIH decided to do two studies to prove whether it did persist or not. One in mice, Dr. Hotzik's study, they took uninfected ticks, it was called xenodiagnostics, gave the mice Lyme disease, treated them with doxy and rocephin, same drugs you would take, put the uninfected ticks on, and lo and behold, eight months later, they're finding the DNA and RNA of the spirochetes in the, what were uninfected ticks, does dead DNA persist in the body? This is the ultimate question that everyone wants to know. Now normally, in pregnancy, you get fetal DNA from the mother that gets into the bloodstream. Within 36 to 42 hours, the spleen removes any foreign DNA from the body, okay? So, when you find eight months later, RNA that's transcribing genes, does dead DNA or RNA, is it possible for it to transcribe genes? Come on, shake your heads back and forth. No, that's impossible, can't happen. So then Dr. Marquez from the NIH does the same thing in humans with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And she finds DNA in uninfected ticks. The NIH must have been so excited because they could have put at the back of that article, oh my God, we finally determined that Lyme persists in the body. What did they actually say in the article? We could do really cool stuff and put uninfected ticks on people and find interesting things. That's called politics, that's not called good science. <laughs> Borrelia biofilms is one of the reasons we're not getting to the bugs. We only really learned about this in the last couple of years. Biofilms have been shown in chronic infections. Years ago, Garth Ehrlich does a great talk on this. He's published multiple articles in the Journal of the American Medical Association. For those of you who are young and you went to the pediatrician and were told you had otitis media, inner ear infections, and it was sterile and it's viral and antibiotics don't work, what they actually found years later is the bugs are in biofilms, and they were there. It's just they couldn't culture them out. And that's the thing about culturing bacteria. In biofilms, these bacteria, these persisters, are dormant. You're not gonna culture them out. These bugs have different growth phases. Some are dormant, some are in cystic form, some are actively replicating. But the dormant ones, you're not gonna be able to culture out. But they found that these provide a physical barrier for antibodies that deep in the biofilms, it's anaerobic, there's no oxygen getting in there, so very difficult sometimes to get to the bottom of the biofilms. So you really have to use a lot of biofilm busters to open it up. But we know that for like Clostridium difficile, Salmonellosis, which is a persister, Candida, Staph, Klebsiella, and Porphyromonas gingivalis. This is really interesting. When you go to the dentist, I just got my teeth cleaning two days ago. When you get your teeth cleaning and they take the plaque off, the plaque is a biofilm. The reason you want to go get the plaque taken off is because if you develop gingivitis with inflammation in your gums, this bacteria, Porphyromonas gingivalis, has now been found in the brains of Alzheimer's patients under biofilms meaning you've got a gingivitis and an inflammatory response in your gums, goes straight up to the central nervous system, and then what happens is your immune system, it creates biofilms, your immune system tries to attack it, and it starts creating amyloid plaque and tau proteins in your brain. They're also finding, and I'll, we'll go into this in a bit, they're also finding Lyme disease spirochetes under biofilms in the brain, as well as chlamydia pneumonia, as well as Helicobacter pylori, that spiral-shaped organism that's in your stomach that causes ulcers, spiral shape like syphilis Lyme, also was found in the biofilms as well as herpes viruses. But we have to be careful because we're finding a lot of bacteria that are now showing up in the biofilms that are stimulating this type of response. I used to think that the treatment failures were mainly cystic forms. 
I was the first doctor about 17 years ago. I presented at the 13th International Lyme Conference a study on flagell. And we found that in people who had Helicobacter pylori, this organism that causes ulcers, we gave them bismuth, tetracycline, and flagell, not knowing they had Lyme, and they herxed. They got really sick. And then we said, gee, I wonder if flagell has an effect on Lyme. We did a paper on it. In fact, it turned out it did hit it, but I didn't know what it hit. Six months later, Dr. Borson in Norway published that it hit the cystic forms of Lyme disease. So this is what I used to think was the only way that Borrelia persisted. Now we know biofilms and persisters were kind of adding to the list. There's literature showing that longer treatment courses work. Again, I don't need to go through this in detail. Just know there's lots of literature showing it persists. And I'm on the ad hoc committee for the WHO. So I'm working with a group of international scientists for the World Health Organization. And we submitted a large paper. Um, there will be a conference in Geneva in June right after the ILADS conference in Paris, we would be meeting with a rapporteur in Geneva to give them this paper and go through it because your insurance companies will not treat you for chronic Lyme disease if there's not a code for chronic Lyme disease. So let me tell you what they do have codes for, and I'm not making this up. Struck by a duck. <laughs> this is true. You can look this up. You're going to love the next one. Struck by a spaceship. I, I am not making this up. This is in the ICD-9, ICD-10 codes. So we are trying to get in the ICD-11 codes. We created a document with Dr. Lieber and myself and international researchers, page after page, on how Lyme persists, the problems with testing, all of the different manifestations in pregnancy. Because if you can't get a code for it, it's not going to be covered. So cross your fingers, the meeting's going to take place in Geneva, okay, in just about a month and a half, okay? We're going to try and get the coding into the literature. When Alison DeLong looked at the antibiotic trial, she found, in fact, that out of those two out of three NIH trials, in fact, people did get better. The Krupp study, their fatigue got better. Brian Fallon's study, cognitively, they got better. PET scans lit up. The problem is they didn't stay better, right? And the reason they didn't stay better is because they didn't look at all the overlapping factors as to why these people were staying ill. So we've got, at this point, what we learn in medical school is something called Pasteur's postulate. There's one cause for one disease. That is not true for 21st century medicine for chronic diseases. When I look at just fatigue alone, I can come up with 36 different reasons why people are fatigued. Everything from Lyme and co-infections like Babesia and Bartonella to autoimmunity to immune dysfunction to you're not sleeping properly from the Lyme and you have food allergies, and it goes on and on. So you have to figure out all the overlapping causes. So when we look at the MSITS model, and this is really the key of how I get people better, when you look at number one out of 16 infections, it's number A, B, C, and D. Bacterial, you've got to look for all the infections. Parasites, especially Babesia, because Rick Osfeld just published in the last two years that at least 80% of the time when you get a tick bite, Babesia kind of tags along and gets in. And in a study I'll show you at the end of this presentation, which is early published study, where we'll publish this at the end of the year, we found that about over 80% of our patients, up to 90%, had Babesiosis. So these were the patients who were not getting better, and Bartonella showed up in about 50% of the patients. I'll show you the graphics on it. So you've got to look for these. Sometimes the viruses will reactivate. Um, some people do have a candida syndrome. So if you're not getting better from Lyme, and you do notice that you're sensitive to carbohydrates and simple sugars, and you have fatigue and aches and pains and brain fog, sometimes you just need to get off treatment and clear out for yeast. And about 10% of those people that we treat will have a candida problem, and they will get better just treating, getting off sugar and treating candidiasis. The second point, immune dysfunction. Lyme causes multiplicities of autoimmune phenomena. You get antithyroid antibodies, antithyroid peroxidase, antithyroid globulin. It can cause a Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It'll cause low adrenals with adrenal antibodies. You get anti-gangliocyte antibodies. So if you have Lyme neuropathy with tingling, numbness, burning, you have to check anti-gangliocyte antibodies to see if you have an autoimmune picture where it's not just the bacteria, but autoimmune phenomenon causing your nerve pain, right? So you have to look at all of these different autoimmune markers, okay, that are in the body. Inflammation, this is the key of the talk today. 
These are the molecules that bring on the fatigue and the headaches and the joint pain. You've got to look for different toxicities. Some people are chemically sensitive. The majority of my patients have heavy metals like mercury. Mercury, lead, and arsenic all cause neuropathy. So if you're a patient who says, I have really bad neuropathy, you've got to start looking at differential diagnosis. Lyme causes neuropathy. Bartonella causes neuropathy. Lead, mercury, and arsenic cause neuropathy. Hypothyroidism can make it worse. So could carpal tunnel, right? You have to look for all the overlapping causes, right? B12 deficiency, diabetes. You have to look for all the overlapping causes of neuropathy. Allergies. It's interesting that people don't realize that what you eat can make a big difference with Lyme treatment because the same inflammatory molecules that are produced in Lyme, if you have leaky gut and food allergies, you are gonna produce the exact same molecules. So my wife, for example, <laughs> the reconnection was successful. <laughs> my wife likes to affectionately call me Itchy Richie. Every time I eat histamine-releasing foods like dairy, I itch. I have something called dramatic graphism. For those of you who'd like to know how allergic you are, take your fingernail and on your forearm here, write your initial and see how long it takes before it comes up, before you form a wheel, before you get a red area that comes up off your skin. First person who sees it, start raising your hand when you start seeing the wheel come up on your skin. One, two. You may not have huge histamine sensitivity, but let me tell you the story about this. When you get off allergic foods, many of my Lyme patients feel better, but also there's a group of Lyme patients that have histamine sensitivity. My wife is a perfect example. She had Lyme disease and she keeps getting better, but she's having resistant migraines and really bad stomach pain. And she was eating a lot of kombucha and fermented vegetables because it's good for you. It turns out that she was histamine sensitive. And the minute she got off histamine foods, the migraines completely went away. When I don't eat dairy and histamine foods, my asthma is gone. I have no asthma symptoms as long as I avoid my allergic foods. So be careful because if your doctor checked you for leaky gut on a CDSA, a comprehensive digestive stool analysis, and did an IgE and an IgG food profile, make sure you also check for histamine and mast cell activation disorder. How do you check for histamine? Histamine in the blood, histamine in the urine, chromogranin A, tryptase levels. There are blood markers for this some of the worst Lyme patients did not know they were histamine sensitive with food allergies. Significant improvements once they got off their allergic foods. Now the problem with gluten, as we talked about earlier, you don't always get anti-gliadin and TTG, the markers for true celiac, you don't always get it. Cyrex Laboratories is a great lab for this, but we can't do it in New York. But they have 20 gluten markers so sometimes you just gotta get off gluten, get off wheat, get off dairy, get off corn, get off shellfish, get off the allergic foods, get on a clean diet, histamine free, and start introducing them one by one and see how your body feels if you're one of these resistant patients. Nutritional deficiencies, 25% of my patients come in, they're deficient in magnesium, copper, iodine, zinc. That keeps the inflammatory reactions going. Number seven, mitochondrial dysfunction. So you get these infections and these environmental toxins and they cause free radicals or oxidative stress in the body. They damage the fragile mitochondria. So the mitochondria are the powerhouses of your cell. They give you energy. You need it for nerve function. You need it for brain function. So if you don't control the free radical oxidative stress and you have mitochondrial dysfunction, it could account for some of the resistant fatigue and some of the other resistant symptoms that you're seeing. We've had people with cardiomyopathy with Lyme-induced problems with the heart, with low ejection fractions, where we gave them CoQ10, acetyl L-carnitine, NT factors, glycosylated phospholipids, we treated the Lyme, and their ejection fraction went all the way back up, where the doctors were just giving them things like um, Coreg and Digoxin and Lasix and ACE inhibitors, the standard treatments for congestive heart failure. They were not treating the Lyme or treating the mitochondrial dysfunction, and then the heart function got significantly better. Then you get Lyme, it's gonna be worse. The key is, if you didn't have a recent traumatic event, and all of a sudden you start noticing, you're anxious, depressed, you have OCD, we have people with sudden onset of OCD, sudden onset of psychosis. 
There's a young man in Pennsylvania that I treated. After 18 years old, when he got his bullseye rash, he became psychotic with schizophrenia. And he was psychotic for years. And he went through doctor to doctor, and they just put him on Risperidol and every psychiatric drug, and no one bothered to test him or treat him for Lyme. When I finally saw him, unfortunately, he was one of the people with the bad Herxheimer reactions. The minute you go into the intracellular compartment with doxycycline or minocycline or zithro, they herx, right? So remember I told you about the parasite story earlier with the guy with Parkinson's who got out of the wheelchair? Not one Lyme drug worked for this kid, but I put him on Dapsone, the protocol I'm going to tell you about at the end of the study. 25 milligrams every other day, very low dose. He started herxing. And the Herx kept getting worse and worse and worse. And by the seventh dose in two weeks, we had to stop it because the Herx was so bad. He comes out of the Herx, he walks out of the room, and he says to his mother, hey, Ma, what's for dinner? I'm really hungry. The kid hasn't spoken in years. Nope. He had what I call a good Herx. <laughs> the way you know the difference between a good Herx and a bad Herx is if you're functioning at 50% of normal, and you go down to 20% with the drugs, and the doctor pulls them off, and you go back to 50%, that's a bad Herx. But if you hang in there, and you get to the other side, you go, wow, I'm now at 60, 70, 80%, that's a good Herx. That means you got into the intracellular compartment, you lowered the load of the bugs, you lowered the biofilm mass. That's usually how this happens for most people. Neurological dysfunction, pretty much every neurological problem you'll see with Lyme, it causes low hormones. You must check adrenal, DHEA cortisol levels by saliva. 40% of my patients are low. One guy who I talked about in the first book, Larry, these are all true stories. 15 years he suffered, was ready to literally throw himself off a bridge and suicide because his symptoms were so severe. He was treated for Lyme, he was detoxed, nothing got him better. But when I looked through the records, I noticed he had low cortisol years ago and nobody bothered to repeat it. When I repeated a saliva test, he was flat. He literally had Addison syndrome. He had almost no cortisol production. Within seven days of going on adrenal hormones, he felt back to 90 to 95% better. Not treating his Lyme, treating his adrenals. One nail. Another story. Let's see how well you've got this. 15-year-old comes into my office. Mother contacts me on Facebook. My daughter's in a wheelchair. She has new onset of seizures. Listen to the clues carefully. New onset of seizures. She can't eat, she can't poop, she can't move her bowels. Right, she's in a wheelchair, my daughter's dying, okay? They fly her up to see me. By the way, she contacts me and says on Facebook, if you don't see me, my daughter's gonna die. Now, I know Jewish guilt. <laughs> but please, no one, don't contact me on Facebook and tell me this. She comes up in a wheelchair, okay? You're gonna get this. She fills out the MSITS questionnaire. First question, she's 15 years old. Do you have drenching sweats? Yes, she has. Oh, you have lots of pain. You're on 480 milligrams of morphine with Norco, with narcotics, and the pain is not controlled. The pain is still like a seven out of 10 in intensity. I said, does your pain migrate around your body? She said, how do you know? What does she have? I lift up her shirt and I examine her and she's got stretch marks going up perpendicular, not in the skin planes. What does she have? Bartonella. Bartonella. You're three out of four. Here's the last one. You'll get it. She's in a wheelchair and she can't walk. She can't stand. I stand her out of the wheelchair. Her blood pressure sitting is 90 over 60 with a pulse of 90. I stand her up. I can't hear her blood pressure and her pulse goes to 130. What does she have? Pots. Pots dysautonomia. Did I do a blood test? I took a history and I examined the patient. Four nails, Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, right, and POTS. She goes out of the office on doxycycline and rifampin for the Lyme and Bart, malarone and artemisia for the Babesia, salt, licorice, and fludrocortisone, Florinef, for the POTS. She comes in one month later, walking out of a wheelchair, no seizures, no narcotics, not one symptom. Oh. I didn't do a blood test. I took a clinical history. These are all true stories. I mean, this is, this is beyond ridiculous that we have to get past this in medical school. I did medical school in Europe for seven years. I was taught how to take a history. I was taught how to do differential diagnosis. That's why I'm an internist, right? You've got to do a differential diagnosis and take a proper history. These people who are chronically ill, you've got to, history and physicals for me are three to four hours, right? I mean, that's what it takes to really do an in-depth history and physical. So sleep disorders, 
Lyme patients don't sleep and they keep waking up. There's a specific sleep problem with Lyme disease called delayed sleep phase syndrome, DSPS. There's only two people on the face of the planet that take hours to fall asleep or keep waking up in the middle of the night. Apart from Lyme disease, what's the other one? Teenagers. <laughs> it's the only two groups. If anyone says to you, it takes me hours to fall asleep, Ambien doesn't work, Lunesta doesn't work, nothing puts me out, delayed sleep phase syndrome, Lyme and teenagers are the only ones that have ever existed. This is a circadian rhythm disorder that actually happens from Lyme. Autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So you get neuropathy with tingling, numbness, burning, but if the neuropathy affects part of your nervous system, which controls your blood pressure, your heart rate, your bowels, your bladder. So if someone comes in and says, I have untractable nausea, vomiting, gastroparesis. I can't stop vomiting. I can't move my bowels. It takes me 14 days to have a bowel movement. Or I can't urinate. The minute you hear the words bowel, bladder are being associated in the body with low blood pressure and fast heart rate, you're thinking POTS dysautonomia. That's autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So what do I do in the office? We do sitting and standing blood pressures. For those of you here, how many people in the audience have been diagnosed with POTS dysautonomia? Oh, that is not a good sign. 40% of my patients. So let's, let's see here, not one diagnosed. Let's do it clinically. How many people, when they stand up, notice they get dizzy and the heart rate starts to go? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we've got about 15 people that just ask you this one simple question. I can pretty much guarantee you, you have some form of POTS dysautonomia. POTS dysautonomia causes fatigue, dizziness, palpitations, brain fog because you're not perfusing your brain, unexplained anxiety because you're secreting norepinephrine like crazy in your body. So the psychiatrist think, oh, you're anxious, here's some Xanax. The answer is you've got to get the autonomic nervous system balanced. So that's one for those of you who are looking for answers here. Sitting and standing blood pressure. Sit for 10 minutes, do a blood pressure pulse. At three minutes, six minutes, and nine minutes, check your blood pressure and pulse. If the blood pressure stays the same or starts to go down and your heart rate starts to go up, anything more than 10 beats, mild, 10 to 20, moderate, anything above 30 is the equivalent of a head up tilt table test in the hospital. That's severe POTS. We can do this usually on a clinical exam. And by the way, everything I'm saying is in the book. How Can I Get Better has all of these protocols in the book if you're writing and you're trying to figure this out. GI disorders, again, we find a lot of leaky gut. You gotta look for parasites. Because if you have Babesia, you're not going to clear the intestinal parasites. I have people, it's a lovely thing, they send me pictures of their poop with parasites on a regular basis. My office manager has it as a screensaver at this point. Uh, and, and they bring them in in jars, by the way. Here, Doc, look at this. Yeah, thanks. I'm really enjoying it. Um, elevated liver functions. I was out in Colorado doing a gala about a month ago for the Live Lyme Gala. Olivia Goodrow, 12 years old, went to 51 doctors in Colorado before they diagnosed her with a tick-borne disease. But they did liver biopsies. By the way, I have HIPAA, she, I'm allowed to share these stories. She had, she had a liver biopsy at 10 years old, okay, with anesthesia because her liver functions were high. Now, no one knew she had Lyme disease, right? Finally, they discovered she had Lyme disease. But she saw 51 doctors, and by the way, it wasn't the Lyme that was raising her liver functions. You'll notice in my book I have a checklist. This is called differential diagnosis. You have elevated liver functions, you check for hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, iron overload, hemochromatosis, copper overload, Wilson's disease. What they didn't check this 12-year-old for was alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is 10% genetically of the US population. Her alpha-1 levels were low. Not one doctor checked it. But I have had patients where their liver functions in the five to 600 range came down with doxycycline. So you have to be very careful because Lyme causes it, Babesia will elevate it, Q fever causes a chronic hepatitis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever will cause elevated liver functions and it looks like an appendicitis. All of these tick-borne infections are great imitators when it comes to the GI tract and the liver. So if you ever get into a situation where you've got a GI and liver issue and they can't figure out what's wrong with you, go look for Lyme and co-infections because that's usually what the gastroenterologists and the doctors miss. P. 
pain syndromes we talked about, and then finally deconditioning. If you're in a wheelchair, obviously, you need physical therapy to get better. So here's the core part of the talk. What is the common denominator of everything I told you about? Inflammation. That's what Ken talked about right earlier today. Chronic infections drive the inflammatory process, causes these autoimmune type disorders, the free radical affects your mitochondrial function. If you've got the wrong bacteria in your gut, they've now shown, for example, if you have Prevotella species in your gut, you have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. If you have higher amounts of Clostridium species in your bowel, you have a higher risk of multiple sclerosis. If you're an autistic kid and you have certain bacteria causing propionic acid to form, you're going to have a higher risk with the gut of getting an autism spectrum disorder. So some of the bacteria are inflammatory and others are anti-inflammatory. So bifidobacterium in general are anti-inflammatory. Certain lactobacillus, like lactobacillus gasseri, is anti-inflammatory. But what we will sometimes do, apart from giving probiotics for Lyme, is we will actually do probiotic enemas. For people who have dysbiosis, we will take over one trillion of the good bacteria and once a week, in a very small enema bottle, start to introduce these, because they're not going to go for fecal transplants. They don't do it unless you've got C. diff. But there are autistic kids that have done fecal transplants and that have done transplants of using microbiota changes, like David Perlmutter used to do this before and show videos, where they would just take probiotic enemas and the autistic kids would get better. Just by changing the microbiome of the gut. Just like when I start talking to you about broccoli seed extract, two-thirds of the autistic population from Harvard got better by detoxing them with broccoli seed extract. I'll show you the studies in just a bit. So the key here is you've got to also look at the gut. This is going to be one of the hallmarks of the frontiers of new age medicine, right? Stem cells and the microbiome of the gut is kind of where a lot of medicine is going. Leaky gut with food allergies, very common, same cytokines. If you can't fall asleep, you have high interleukin-6, one of these inflammatory cytokines. Heavy metals, pesticides, volatile organic solvents, small particle pollution, drives the inflammatory process. These have all now been linked up to autoimmune diseases in the last four years. They have shown that volatile organic solvents, small particle pollution, BPA, is causing a lot of the autoimmune phenomenon that we're seeing. It's not just genetic factors. It is related to some of the environmental toxins that are getting into people's bodies. And by the way, they've now associated with Alzheimer's also small particle pollution and pesticides. JAMA published several years ago, they're finding pesticides in the brains of Alzheimer's patients also. So I'll show you what the theory is of where I'm at at these days with a lot of these chronic diseases in the next few slides. You've got to replace the nutritional deficiencies. If you have low zinc, you don't just check the zinc in your serum, you check red blood cell zinc. 99% of some of your most essential minerals are inside your red cells. They're not in the serum. So if your doctor only checks a serum magnesium, a serum copper, a serum zinc, you're going to miss whether you're mineral deficient. And if you don't have enough of these minerals, the inflammatory process is going to continue. And you need zinc, actually, to fight infections. Endocrine disorders. As we said, you've got to look at all the hormones. And you've got to check for POTS dysautonomia. From what I saw from the hands in the audience, you're going to find that some of the people here who raise their hands with night sweats, day sweats, ongoing babesia, and POTS, that's going to be some of the nails that need to be pulled to get you better. So the three eyes in chronic disease, this is the common denominator, is these different environmental toxins combined with infections, right, and overlapping factors on the MSIDS map are causing inflammation, specifically these particular chemicals called interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, the nitric oxide pathway, they call it oxidative stress, they damage the mitochondria, and they cause a lot of these different symptoms. And you'll notice, even in autism, right, in the inflammatory cytokines marker of immunological dysfunction, they found the same inflammatory cytokines in the autistic population that they found in the patients with Lyme disease. So if we look at this, and we look at the combination of infections getting in, sometimes the docs forget that these infections also produce neurotoxins. There is a toxin produced with Lyme disease called quinolinic acid. When I give people two grams of IV glutathione in my office, and they say within minutes that their brain fog clears, I'm probably pulling out inflammatory cytokines and neurotoxins. One young man in my practice who was a computer programmer who was on a couch for two years watching Netflix reruns, the first visit to me, I gave him two grams of glutathione. 
and he was disabled. He could not work as a programmer. By the time he walked out of the office, his brain function was back completely to normal. So I gave him N-acetylcysteine, NAC, alpha lipoic acid, and two grams of liposomal oral glutathione every day, and he's remained at work forever since. But not treating his Lyme, detoxing him. So that's why in the seven point action plan that I discuss in the new book, detox, 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 is on the top of the list because you've got to pull out the neurotoxins from Lyme, but also all of these environmental toxins that help that autoimmune reaction that's being caused by the bacteria with Borrelia. So you've got something with Borrelia called molecular mimicry. In some people, when your immune system tries attacking the flagellum, which is the parts of the bacteria with the tails that move it through the tissues, it affects your myelin sheet that surrounds your nerves and you get demyelination. That's why you see so much neuropathy in people with Lyme disease. But you see the same type of processes in people with lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, Alzheimer's, environmental illness. The interesting part is the same phenomenon is taking place in all these chronic diseases. So there's small cells in the brain called microglial cells. They know in Alzheimer's disease, and same thing with Lyme, that when you start stimulating these cells, these are the cells in the brain that produce these inflammatory molecules and cause actually the symptoms of Alzheimer's with memory loss and cognitive difficulties. But you see the same exact thing with other illnesses. So for example, with Lyme, they found the same inflammatory cytokines in the brain. We know the toxins like quinolinic acid, chloral hydrate can be produced if you're zinc deficient and that makes you very spacey. And pesticides can cause neurological problems and it all causes inflammation. So infections and toxins are driving the inflammatory process. What about multiple sclerosis? This is all published in the medical literature. We see it with Lyme. It's been published for chlamydia pneumonia. And two years ago, they found that Epstein-Barr virus variants were associated with MS. So infections, toxins like mercury, has retrograde transport into the brain, causes demyelination, you see the same thing with BPA and asbestos. And by the way, everybody at this point has BPA. So when I sign at this point the receipts, I don't keep any receipts anymore. I don't hold on to them, okay? Don't keep holding on to those receipts. That's where a lot of the BPA is coming from that you're exposed to on a regular basis. But they do cause demyelination and autoimmunity. And they've seen with MS that low vitamin D has been associated with MS. Now here's what's really fascinating. How many people here in the audience with Lyme tested positive for low vitamin D? Raise your hand. Okay, fair majority. It's probably not just that you're not outside getting sun. What they actually found is, is that if you have a ratio in your body of the 125 vitamin D, which is the active vitamin D, if your ratio of 125 to 25, the 25 hydroxy is what your doctors checked you for. That's made by the kidney. That's, I'm sorry, that's made by the liver. A 125 to 25 ratio that's more than two to one implies inflammation. And where is the inflammation coming from? Intracellular bacteria. What they've discovered is it's the bacteria that are inside the cells, whether it's Lyme, whether it's Bartonella, whether it's mycoplasma, that are stimulating the inflammatory response and they're hitting your vitamin D receptors. So you can actually use a two to one ratio of 125 to 25 vitamin D as a marker of inflammation, just like you would use a CRP or a sedimentation rate or C3A, C4A, there are many markers of inflammation that doctors use, and again, I've, I've got them all listed out in the book for your doctor. What about autism? Well, Ken talked to you about this. When I go to Europe and I lecture, they have autistic kids that they put on antibiotics who get better, okay? Just by giving them Zithromax and antibiotics. UC California Davis and Harvard found that the higher your risk of having pesticides, for example, if you live close to a highway, and you were exposed in the womb to mercury, lead, manganese, methylene chloride, and diesel, those were the people who had the highest risk of autism spectrum disorder. Because these are all fat-soluble toxins affecting the neurodegenerative pathways of the brain. And then they found the same inflammatory cytokines in the brains of autism patients that they found in MS, that they found in Lyme. What about Alzheimer's? This was just published. Seven out of 20 patients with Alzheimer's disease had Lyme, Chlamydia pneumonia, Helicobacter pylori, herpes viruses in their brains, and the higher your infectious burden, the more bacteria or viruses, the greater your risk of getting Alzheimer's, as well as finding in JAMA pesticides. And when they looked through the Framingham study years ago, they found it was inflammation 
that was causing the Alzheimer's symptoms because once they gave them things that blocked cytokines, these inflammatory molecules, the Alzheimer's patient's memories got better. Infections and toxins causing inflammation in Alzheimer's, in MS, in autism, in Lyme. The common denominator is that you have to find a way to shut down the inflammatory process. So when you've got all of these infections and toxins turning on inflammation in the body, we'll use things like Plaquenil, we might use IVIG, IV immunoglobulins, but what you do from an integrative standpoint is you downregulate it using things like antioxidants, CoQ10, B vitamins, glutathione precursors, alpha lipoic acid. We find that for a lot of people with inflammation, these are particularly effective. So there's a switch inside your nucleus that turns on the inflammatory process. It's called NF-kappa B. How do you block NF-kappa B? You block it with glutathione. You block it with antioxidants. You block it with alpha lipoic acid. And when we look at all of these chronic diseases, when I started off the talk and said that 86% of our healthcare costs are due to chronic disease, inflammation is the number one underlying cause whether you're talking about Alzheimer's, strokes, heart attacks, Lyme disease, asthma, it doesn't matter. It's all been shown to be associated with an inflammatory process in the body. So this is how we lower the inflammation. If we know that this switch inside the nucleus turns on inflammation, we want to shut it down. How do we do it? There's four nutritional supplements that I regularly use. Green tea extract, curcumin, resveratrol, and broccoli seed extract. Broccoli seed extract, or sulforaphane glucosinolate, is the strongest detoxifier in the liver of all of these chemicals coming in. So it shuts down the inflammatory process. It opens up the detox pathways. And what I love about broccoli seed extract is it hits the P53 genes in the body, which affect cancer. So my whole family died of cancer. I'm taking 200 milligrams a day of broccoli seed extract. Okay? And all of the dosages, again, are in the book. But I use high-dose curcumin, broccoli seed extract, tree tree, and resveratrol. There is a compounded medication called low-dose naltrexone. I explained to you with Lyme and Alzheimer's, these small cells in the brain, microglial cells, is what turns on the inflammation. When you give low-dose naltrexone, it shuts down those microglial activations inside the brain. You do an anti-inflammatory diet. Okay? The two main anti-inflammatory diets that most people know about is the paleo diet and the Mediterranean diet. How many people here think the Mediterranean diet is better than paleo? Raise your hand. Oh, nobody's going to look at this one. How many think paleo is better than Mediterranean? You'd both be right. It turns out in the literature last year, they did a study of the Mediterranean diet and the paleo diet, and they showed they both lowered inflammation. They both worked on the inflammatory process. But generally, a Mediterranean diet with lots of extra virgin olive oil, fresh fruits and vegetables, eating organic, mainly berries, right, lower carb fruits, clean meats, proteins, be careful with the fish because of what's going on with the pollution. But that's how you also can help with the inflammatory process. Replace your minerals, that lowers inflammation. Get proper sleep. If you don't get to sleep, you can't shut down the inflammatory process, right? Treat the infections. Detox all these chemicals that are getting in that are driving the inflammatory process. Balance all the hormones. Balance the cytokines and balance that microbiome of the gut. Because we said there are good and bad bacteria in the gut that can cause inflammation. Heal the damage to the body because if you don't repair the mitochondrial damage, you can treat all the infections and get the hormones balanced, right, and get people to sleep, but you still have to heal the damage to the body. So in about a third of the people, we have to use mitochondrial supplements, and they do notice that there's a difference. And finally, you've got to also heal the damage to the mind and emotions, because some people have PTSD, because just from going to 10 to 20 doctors being told it's all in their head, right? You can end up with PTSD. What I like to tell them, by the way, is it is all in your head. You've got Lyme in your head. You've got neurotoxins in your head. You've got, it's all in your head. So. When we're looking at lower inflammation, there is a molecule also, apart from this switch inside the nucleus called NF-kappa B, there's a molecule inside your cells called NRF2, NRF2. When you get these free radicals, NRF2 goes into your nucleus and it stimulates genes in the body called the antioxidant response element genes. These help with detoxification. They lower inflammation and they shut down cancer. 
So that is why we use a lot of these nutritional supplements and a lot of people using these phytochemicals. Very, very important, and we found that they are helpful. So LDN, it's been published for Crohn's, fibromyalgia, MS. Use it for Lyme all the time. The only thing you need to know about low-dose naltrexone is it can give people a sleep problem in 10 to 20%. If you can't sleep on LDN, take it first thing in the morning. Okay, you can't be on long-acting narcotics, okay, because it's going to block the narcotics. You'll notice with the foods, if you look to the right, with mediator release, all of these inflammatory mediators, these are the same ones we don't want, that we have with Lyme and toxins, it's the same ones that are produced with foods. Right, you got to get off your food allergies, as we talked about. Big, big difference. And by the way, there are some people now that are getting what's called an alpha-gal allergy. They get bit by the Lone Star tick, and all of a sudden they start eating meat, lamb, different forms of meat, and six hours later they're in the emergency room with an anaphylactic reaction. And that is because they're getting anaphylaxis to a certain protein that the Lone Star tick injected into the skin. So if you ever have anyone that has an unexplained anaphylactic reaction, but hours after they eat, that's usually from an alpha-gal allergy. Replace the minerals, you'll notice it's necessary for detox. It's necessary for free radicals. Zinc is necessary, um, not just for cytokines, but for getting rid of certain chemicals in the body. You gotta get to sleep, but again, the thing about the sleep is yes, Lyme causes a sleep disorder, but I have young, thin women who have sleep apnea. You may have to get a sleep study done, right? Or you're drinking espressos too late in the day. <laughs> or you might have restless leg syndrome. Or you might have a prostate problem and you're getting up to urinate, right? About 40% of the hip fractures in adults is because they get up to urinate in the middle of the night with bad balance problems. So we have to watch carefully, right, when you're getting up in the middle of the night for this. So there's different things we use for sleep, but basically what you need to know is I don't use any Ambien and Lunesta. There are drugs that affect the REM pathways when you're trying to get to sleep. So non-REM into REM dream sleep, we use things like Trazodone, Gabitril, Lyrica, things that you don't normally use for sleep will help certain people with sleep. You detoxify, use methylation, use glutathione. There's a large number of people when they detoxify with glutathione, they feel significantly better and this really helps with the Herxheimer reactions. So for Herx's, we use Alka-Seltzer Gold, not the regular because it's got aluminum. I don't want you to have any more dementia than is already out there. Straight sodium bicarbonate or lemon and lime water will alkalize your body with two grams of liposomal glutathione. That will help about 70% of people with Herxheimer reactions. Okay, so that's, that's a trick as far as detoxing. You've got to get out quinolinic acid. We're finding mold toxins now in about two thirds of our patients. They have aflatoxins, trichothicines, and gliotoxins. The reason I'm concerned about the gliotoxins is the gliotoxins specifically are immunosuppressive. So we talked about Lyme suppressing the immune system, Babesia suppressing parasites, Bartonella suppressing the immune system, gliotoxins and mercury are also having a problem and effect on your immunity. We find a lot of metals and a lot of pesticides. So this would be like an average heavy metal test in my practice. When you look at heavy metals and Lyme, exactly the same symptoms. About 20 to 25% of my Lyme patients, when I pull out the heavy metals, say, Doc, those resistant symptoms I thought were Lyme, they were heavy metals and toxins. It's not a high percentage, but it's something that's definitely worth looking into. This was one of my Parkinson's patients who we tested through Pactox, and we found massive doses of pesticides. We know with glutathione, some of these Parkinsonian patients get better just from detoxing them, so a lot of times you've got to get these pesticides out of the body. It's now been clearly associated with Parkinson's, and as I said in the JAMA article, they're finding them in the brains of Alzheimer's. If you put brain cells in culture with pesticides, it forms amyloid plaque, okay? So detoxification is really, really important. You hydrate, you get your antioxidants up, you help the liver to get rid of these toxins, you minimize your exposure, you help the bowel health, and again, this is all in the book, but we'll use things like far infrared saunas, to sweat the toxins out. We might chelate the metals. Uh, we'll do mold detox with phosphatidylcholine and glutathione. And again, we'll use a lot of minerals and a lot of these um, natural products like broccoli seed extract um, and dim methane to help with the detoxification pathways. Make sure you're checking the hormones. Adrenals, very important. Make sure you're checking, again, male hormones, even in young men. 
Um, we do see thyroid problems. And again, blood pressure pots, very important to check. We talked about the mitochondria, um, that about a third, 25% of our patients do feel better. Interesting, when you use doxycycline, you may not know this, but doxy actually affects, adversely affects the mitochondria. So when you're done with your antibiotics for treating Lyme, some form of mitochondrial support is actually not unreasonable. They're actually using doxycycline to kill off cancer stem cells because it affects the mitochondria. So they're finding all kinds of interesting uses for the tetracyclines. And then again, you're going to look at the microbiome of the gut, as we talked about, checking for gluten, checking for food sensitivities. Uh, many people have SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. You can do this on breath tests. But again, the gut has to be in order. And some of these gut bacteria even affect your epigenetics. So in other words, how you deal with these toxins, which can be passed on from generation to generation. Um, this is just one example of one of the bacteria, Lactobacillus caesarei. It helps with weight loss. It helps with menstrual pain. Um, they showed that it was very effective in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And Dr. Bach had showed you the TH17. They found that Lactobacillus suppresses TH17, which is associated with inflammation and autoimmune disease, which, by the way, so does melatonin. When you take melatonin to sleep at night, melatonin also affects TH17. So it has an effect on it as an antioxidant to get you to sleep and to modulate TH17. And finally, we talk about meditation um, a lot to our patients because they found that as I'm lowering inflammation, Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize, found that meditation lowered the same inflammatory cytokines I've been telling you about, lowered depression and anxiety, and helped your telomeres to lengthen, which has usually been associated with longevity. Okay? So meditation and yoga and natural relaxation techniques, very important. And then the last part of the talk. So years ago when I was treating Lyme, I basically said, okay, we're going to hit the cell wall forms with a penicillin or a cephalosporin. And we're going to treat your cystic forms with Plaquenil, grapefruit seed extract, or Flagyl. And we're going to go inside those cells with Zithromax or Biaxin. And then people did better with the 16-point emphasis. And then we started learning about biofilms and persisters. Now we're starting to use things like serapeptase, stevia extract, because Dr. Eva Shapi from the University of New Haven showed that neutromedic stevia was effective in hitting biofilms and hitting different forms of Borrelia. Lorisidin, which is model Lauren or coconut oil extract, opens up biofilms, hits different forms of Borrelia. Biocidin which is a natural herbal protocol, will probably be published this year through the University of Finland. It's biofilms, different forms of Borrelia. So you have to start thinking about biofilms where the bacteria are hiding, and of course treating the co-infections. So just so you realize that it's not that we don't get help when we use things like doxyrifampin, like I talked to you about that young girl in the wheelchair. If you use something like doxyrifampin and Bactrim, if you're not sulfur sensitive, that's going to hit most of your intracellular bacteria. But some people, for example, hurts with rifampin. They might need doxyzithro. The point is it's all individualized. What I have to do with patients is find out your wiring. Do you like doxy? Like, do you feel better? Do you get no response? Or do you hurt? Do you like Zithromax? So I need the wiring to know where the bugs are hiding and where the load is. And that, that's when I personalize. There's not one person in my practice that gets the same protocol. But what we're now looking at, which is a little different, is using persister drugs. And I published the first oral persister protocol. In fact, it was right after the last conference we did last year. It got published in the medical literature on Dapsone, and I'll show you those papers today. So we need to look at persisters because it's been published by John Hopkins researchers and Kim Lewis in the last several years that we're now finding these persister bacteria with Lyme disease. <coughs> these persisters, basically, when they look at them in culture, and Kim Lewis did this. He would use rocephin. It would get rid of 99% of the bacteria. He'd take off the rocephin, and the bacteria would grow back. So 99% were killed, 1% were alive, grew back. He gave him rocephin again. 99% were killed. He stopped the rocephin. The bugs grew back. He had to use continuous pulsing to try and get it. Now you'd think, well, that might be the answer. And by the way, we've done those studies. There are a small percentage of people who we pulse rocephin cell wall minocycline with Tindamax, and we do find that in some people it has worked actually very, very well. However, we can't really say it works in the study because what Kim Lewis does it was in young cultures of bacteria. 
So I did two papers that I published in the medical literature this past year. Our mycobacterium drugs, the drugs that are used to treat tuberculosis and leprosy, are they effective in Lyme, in co-infections, and in autoimmune diseases? So here is a woman with a very unusual autoimmune disease called Bisset syndrome. She was sick for 19 years on every immunosuppressive drug known to mankind. Dapsone, the drug I'm about to tell you about, is useful for Bisset's. However, it did not work for her. You see these big ulcers that she has on the side of her tongue? You see the big nodules and how swollen her joints are? I gave her an old tuberculosis drug called pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide is a persister drug that is used for tuberculosis, and within two months, for the first time in 20 years, her besets cleared up and her hand and went away. Now, you know what it turned out that those nodules were on her hand? Bartonella. She had a negative Bartonella titer and a negative VGF, and when I treated her with this drug with Dapsone, her Bartonella turned positive, her VGF went up, and she had a low positive tularemia titer that went from 1 to 20 to 1 to 320, and herpes virus 6 went up fourfold. She reactivated Bartonella, tularemia, and herpes virus 6, and once I treated all of this, she got completely better. But with using tuberculosis drugs to go inside the cells, and this woman had been tried on every drug known to mankind. So Dapsone is the second paper that I published this year. This was initially in 100 people who had failed every drug regimen for Lyme disease. We found that Dapsone, which is a drug that was usually used with rifampin and clofazamine, mainly for things like um, leprosy, we found that other sulfur drugs, according to Dr. Zong, and he just published the study, other sulfur drugs have been shown to be useful for persisters with Lyme disease. So they used Dapsone for leprosy, for toxoplasmosis. If you went to India to not get malaria, they used to give people Dapsone. Um, it's used for acne. I had people come in all the time on Dapsone for acne. But no one ever thought of using it for Lyme disease. Why did I think it might be a useful drug for Lyme? Dapsone hits parasites. Do most of the people who come to me have Babesia, which is a parasite? Yes. So Dapsone hits persisters, like Lyme. It hits parasites and it's used for autoimmune illness. Dapsone is published for autoimmune disease, so it looked like a perfect drug. We've now given it over 400 people, and we found that it was very effective. But the one thing you have to watch for for this drug is called do no harm. Age people get Herxheimer reactions to beat the bandwagon. If you, someone says to me, Doc, I've never had a Herx, I'll say, I'll give you a Herx, here's Dapsone. <laughs> it's a Herx drug. You have to go slow in some of these people. Okay? The first woman that I gave this to early on in the treatment, I didn't realize I was just giving her 100 milligrams. She herxed for four weeks, but when she came out of the herx, and this is the one I published in the study, she went from like 20% of normal to almost 90%. She was sick for 13 years. When she came through the herx, she had a magnificent response, but it's very, very bad herxes with this drug. Anemia, you're going to drop your hemoglobin between 2 to 3 grams. You need to use anywhere between 15 to 25 milligrams of folic acid twice a day. And women, I would not suggest using it if you're iron deficient. You need to get your iron deficiency anemia taken care of before you use this drug. You can't use it if you have severe sulfur sensitivities, but interestingly, if you're allergic to Bactrim, a sulfur drug, most people can take Dapsone. But I would use like Zyrtec and Zantac, an H1, H2 blocker if I was gonna do it. And you have to watch for methemoglobinemia. What is methemoglobinemia? So some of you have seen the Blue Man Group. Methemoglobinemia is when you can't carry oxygen on your red blood cells, you get blue hands and blue lips. I've only seen this happen with a handful of people, but the one that it was the worst, this woman decided to go get IV ozone on her own. You cannot do oxidative therapies while you're on Dapsone. You will get a high level of methemoglobinemia. So who's going to consider Dapsone? Well, if you've failed pretty much every drug for Lyme disease, you've done IV, you've tried every drug, you want to look at a persister drug like this, okay? If you have co-infections, like Bartonella mycoplasma, you want to consider it, especially Babesia, because it hits parasites. And let's say you have not done IV rocephin. I have people whose cognitive symptoms improve with oral Dapsone that never need an IV line put in. This drug can be very effective for neurocognitive deficits in people with Lyme. So even if you don't know statistics, if you look at the p-values on the right-hand side, anything less than 0.05 is statistically significant. 
The first study we did, the Dapsone helped with fatigue, joint pain, tingling, numbness, burning, sleep, memory concentration. And look at the day sweats, night sweats, Babesia less than 0.001. The only thing it didn't help initially was headaches. But we have a second study we're going to publish this year, actually, where it was statistically significant also in headaches. Who's going to take it for Babesia? You have ongoing day sweats, night sweats, chills. You failed Mepron. You failed Malarum. You failed clindamycin and quinine. You failed artemisia. You failed cryptolepis. You failed neem. You failed daraprim. You failed every malaria herb, every malaria drug, and you still have ongoing Babesia. You may want to look at Dapsum and use it with malarone and artemisinin, and it's very effective in combination. When we looked at the sweats with Dapsone, moderate sweats went down, severe went from 16 to 5%, and the severe sweats went completely away. But this is usually with Dapsone and malarone. What we don't know is what's the dose of Dapsone and the length of time. When you treat leprosy to cure, it's at least 12 months, and it's at a full 100 milligrams. What I can tell you is the higher the dose of the Dapsone, the better it works. The one thing, though, that we now know is Eva Shapi did a study with us that we presented at the International Lyme Conference this past uh, fall. And what she found is, is when you look at biofilm colonies, these are the persisters. These are the most difficult forms of Lyme to get rid of, right? Doxy alone doesn't do much for biofilms. Dapsone rifampin, only a little bit. Look at Doxy rifampin and Dapsone. <coughs> Cephuropsin is, se is ceftin. The most effective protocol of all the protocols was doxy, rifampin, and dapsone, three intracellular drugs. Rifampin turns out to be extremely important. If you can't take rifampin, there's another TB drug called rifabutin or mycobutin. Some people tolerate rif rifabutin or mycobutin better than rifampin. We've had some amazing successes. But I have to use three or four intracellular drugs. I may use Zithromax or Aquinolone, like Levaquin or Avalox, if they've got bad BART. And in the woman, the prior one I showed you with Bissette's, when she had tularemia, I gave her Doxy, Dapsone, Rifampin, and Avalox, and I kicked out her tularemia, which is a persister, using four intracellular drugs. And she was on immunosuppressive therapies. Okay, tularemia is a very difficult bug to get rid of in the intracellular compartment. This is new research that no one has seen. This is the research we're going to be publishing at the end of the year. We got a grant from Bay Area Lyme to data mine our charts on Dapsone. So we looked at 200 people on Dapsone. The first study was 100. You had to have an inclusion of an EM rash or positive Lyme testing. Most of the people here were female. And 53% currently on Dapsone, 43% off. We looked at the treatment. The first Dapsone study was one to four months. This is now going on seven months, but the longest was up to 20 months. We looked at the same symptoms before and after Dapsone. Every symptom, P less than 0.01, for every one using Dapsone, Doxy, Rifampin. Statistically significant for every symptom with people with chronic Lyme who had failed classical therapies. Now the problem with this is one third of the people cannot take Dapsone. They're too sensitive. The herxes are too severe, they can't take the anemia, they get methemoglobinemia. It's not that this is gonna work for everyone. And I don't think, by the way, it's yet a cure. But what I can tell you is it's probably the closest getting to what I think is gonna to lead to a cure, starting to use these persister drug with biofilm busters. When we looked at the pre and post symptoms, you can notice that they get better in almost every one. And we looked at the co-infections, Babesia, 80%. Bartonella, more than half. You've got to look for brucella. You've got to look for tularemia, right? Q fever. You're going to find a lot of these co-infections showing up, and a lot of the doctors never bother to do a broad tick-borne panel. So we will use the herbs, and in the people who can take, let's say, more than three antibiotics, we'll mix in the Cowden protocol with cementobandrol. We'll mix in Chinese herbs like Coptis and Hudiana. Okay? We'll mix in herbal protocols or use them afterwards, and we still find that this can be extremely effective, especially for people with candida in the gut that can't take multiple antibiotics. Dapsone, by the way, has no effect on the gut. It has no effect on the microbiome. No diarrhea and no yeast with this drug. It has a lot of other side effects, but it does not affect the microbiome. And that's one of the good things about using this drug longer term. So putting it together, it's not Lyme disease. Right? It's Lyme MSIDS. There's up to 16 reasons why these people stay sick. 
You've got to go through all 16 differential categories. It creates inflammation in the body. You've got to look at the neurotoxins, whether it's heavy metals, whether it's mold, whether it's toxins produced by the Lyme itself. You've got to look for autoimmunity and molecular mimicry. But as I showed you, for all these chronic diseases, no matter what you're calling it, the inflammatory process is underlying a lot of these chronic diseases that we're suffering with that are driving the healthcare costs and disability in the United States. So you've got to treat all three forms of Lyme. You've got to now go after the biofilms and persisters, look at the co-infections, look at what's driving the inflammatory response, right? Address the immune dysfunction, um, get those hormones balanced, detoxify the patients, get them to sleep, get them off the allergic foods. It's not really that difficult if you just go through the 16-point model piece by piece with your physician. You'll usually find the nails that have not yet been pulled that are keeping people sick. So how do you get off the Lyme Hell Ride? Bon voyage, I can't say when I'll let you off this thing. The way you get off the Lyme Hell Ride is you've got to look at biofilms, at persisters. This is where the research is going. I'm very encouraged because I've been doing this now for three decades where I get the sickest patients who come to me and I can tell you that looking at biofilms and persisters, we're starting to get results in patients. So in my first book, Why Can I Get Better? 90 to 92% of the patients got better with that protocol. This new book, How Can I Get Better? which discusses the Dapsone protocol in detail that you can do with your doctor, of that 8% that I couldn't get better, probably two thirds of those people are getting better with persister drugs. Pyrazinamide, Dapsone, I'm using tuberculosis type regimens for these bugs that are hiding inside the cells and deep in the biofilms. And now we're gonna be doing a prospective study at the end of the year, we got research money, we got about a quarter million dollars in research money through two foundations, so we will be setting up a multi-center study. It'll be done either through John Hopkins, if I can get uh, Dr. Zhang to do this, or it'll be done through probably Stanford, but we'll have a multi-center study we're gonna be set up at the end of this year as a prospective Dapsone study that could be published in the literature so your insurance companies can say to you once and for all, oh gee, I guess there are some drugs that actually help chronic Lyme disease patients. So thank you so much for your attention today.